victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross made for sin His blood atoned One final breath And it was finished But not the end We could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice
seat. Well, good morning, Northland. What a way to open up our service, right? <laughs> Amen. Our worship focus for this weekend is Christ the risen Savior. And so my question for you is, where do you need to see Jesus resurrected in your life? Maybe that's in your work or in your home life, in your relationships, in your worship, in your prayer. What we've done for this service is we've intentionally set aside some time for you to reflect and answer that question of where do I need to see Jesus resurrected in my life? And so what I want you to do in just a moment, think about your answer to that question. And in just a moment, we're gonna have some time where you can just shout that out loud. Now, I know some of you may be a little intimidated by the thought of expressing that out loud, but I really encourage you to step out of your comfort zone today because in Hebrews 4.16, it tells us, come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there is nothing timid about entering the throne room of the Lord Almighty. So I really encourage you to be bold and confident when going to Christ. Again, we're gonna take this time to reflect and think about an area of our life where maybe we've put Jesus in the background and we want to see him resurrected there. So once you have that in your mind, go ahead and say that out loud now. time. 
standing as we will take a few moments now to turn our eyes unto Jesus I will read two sections of scripture and we have a guided prayer as we look to the king of kings the first scripture I will read is from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 Paul is praying and I pray that prayer for us today right here in this room those joining us online on any location you're in Paul writes I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have, he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We're going to be praying for our hearts that God has given to us, that these hearts are fully dedicated, are fully devoted to Jesus as we follow him. We'll be praying that. But also in times like these, you think about, we live in Florida here, you think about hurricanes, and nationally you think about pandemic, and you think about our country, uh, we're thinking about elections, and all of these, these are the realities of life that we face each day. But we always need to come back to what has God said in his word. So let me read a scripture, then we'll pray for our local officials from our cities, Wherever city you're in, I'll be praying for Richard. We live in Longwood here. He's our mayor of Longwood. And you pray for the other cities where you are. We pray for our state. We pray for our president. And we pray for the nations that God has brought all of us together. So I'll be reading from 
First Timothy chapter 2, Paul again writes, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Please join me as we pray for ourselves and for the others that God has called us to. Father, right now in this room and online and everywhere the award is being proclaimed, men and women, boys and girls, are coming to you, Father, with our hearts. We are coming, Father, because you know each heart that is represented in this room, each family, each child, each parent, each grandparent. So, Father, I stand in the gap and pray that where, Father, families are facing financial challenges, meet their needs, that they will trust you. Where, Father, there is sickness, there is disease, bring healing, Father. And, Father, I pray for the marriages and the challenging things that are going on in parenting and the lives of husband and wife. Father, I pray that the unity of Christ, that the hearts will be enlightened towards Jesus. Lord, we know you will do that. Meet the needs. Pray for our children as they start to come back in grade school and lower. Father, we pray for these parents that you will keep our children safe, not only on Sundays, but during the week, Father. Pray for student ministries as they get back here later tonight and during the week. We pray, Father, your word will dwell in these boys and girls and men and women. Father, we come before you because you are the Lord of all the nations. So we pray for our nation at this time. Father, we pray that even in this pandemic that is global and also local and touches our lives, bring healing, Father, for the, from the Papa to our President, everybody in between. Father, you are the great healer. You will heal through medicine. We pray, Father, for our healthcare workers. We pray those who are in hospital right now. And Father, they'll be struggling with some kind of sickness. Lord, we pray you heal. I pray you, you bring healing to our president and his wife and the family and everyone who is battling this COVID-19. Father, we pray you will heal through medicine. Father, we pray that you will heal by miracles because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, you will heal our bodies that you've given to us. So here we are, Father. We lay all this before you. We pray, Father, that the unity of Christ may dwell among our people. That, Father, we will seek to look at the face of Jesus during these times that we are facing. So, Lord, we now want to hear your word. We pray, Lord, our hearts, our ears may be open, Father, to what you are going to be saying through your servant, Pastor Matt Heard. We pray for a special anointing. We pray, Father, for understanding and obedience to your word. So here we come, Lord Jesus, with our hearts that needs to be enlightened, with our ears that need to understand, give clarity, Lord, that we will live here better than we came in today. And all God's people will give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm Pastor Matt Hurd. Thank you, Gus. Well, good morning. It, it's awesome to see you guys here. Also online, welcome. We're glad you're here. I've got a question for you. Tomorrow morning, how many of you will have a to-do list as you go into your day? All right. We all have them, either in our minds or on our uh, devices. I actually use devices, but I also just love the good old-fashioned note paper where you put to-do and write them down. So here's another question for you that you can think about, and we're going to be pondering this entire time. Did Jesus have a to-do list? And most of you know the answer to that, absolutely. There was an intentionality about what he came to do. He wasn't this, this Jewish carpenter that all of a sudden got a real good gift of teaching and grasp of theology and gained a following and tragically was, was crucified and then turned into a martyr and a religion was established uh, in his memory. It, the opposite was true. 
He came with a very distinct mission. He gives indications of that throughout the Gospels. In this series that we're calling Awaken, we're going through John's Gospel and unpacking the agenda of Jesus, bottom line. And it is to awaken the cosmos. It's to awaken us as men and women who were born, the Scriptures say, dead in our transgressions and sins. Hearts are beating, lungs are breathing, but we lack the zoe. Z-O-E is a transliteration of the Greek word that John uses most often, over 70 times, to describe the life we lack. It's translated life, but it's not heart beating, lung breathing. It's the life of God. Jesus indicates in John 10.10, you know the verse well, He says, the thief, he came with an agenda to steal and to kill and destroy, to, to deaden humanity to the glory of God, to the purposes of God. He says, but I've come that they may have life, zoe, and have it to the full. That's at the top of His agenda. But what's ironic is that the way for Him to accomplish that life of the world, to bring life to the world, he had to die for the life of the world. If you've got your Bibles, take it out and turn to John's Gospel. This is a very heavy section of John's Gospel, but it is so rich. And by the way, if you haven't listened to Pastor Joel's message from last week, go ahead and access that as well. But in verse 17 of John 19. We have a description, not of a martyr's death, but the one who came to die for the life of the world. It's going to be a long passage, so I'm going to ask you to hang in there and engage. Uh, we usually are used to reading phrases, paragraphs, nothing more than 30 seconds at a time uh, in soundbite culture. Uh, listen to a friend of Jesus's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, describe what happened on that Friday morning all the way to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Isaiah 53 talks about he was was numbered with the transgressors. He was up there with other transgressors, but he was without sin. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews, these reli- the religious crowd who was wanting to get rid of Jesus, they read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, saying, do not write the King of the Jews, but write that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. All of this is underneath the plan of God. You can see it unfolding. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them. With the undergarment remaining, and this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. And this happened that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Again, the fullness of time. That scripture that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And so this is what the soldiers did. Now near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's most often referring to John. That's how John referred to himself. Standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, pointing to John. And he looks to John and he says, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So in the midst of this unspeakable, horrific act of execution, Jesus was thinking about his mom. As to his infinity, he was also thinking about you. 
by name. By name. By name. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. The other three synoptic gospels use the phrase phane megale, meaning in a loud voice he said that. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, we're going to come back to that, but I want you to keep reading verse 31. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the, uh, left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The way that a person would typically die of crucifixion is they would die of suffocation because hands nailed to the crossbar, their feet were nailed, and they would push up to allow their, their lungs air because they were losing the strength of diaphragm. And so to hasten death at times, they would break their legs so they could no longer push up. And so they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, there's some that would say, oh, they, since his legs weren't broken, there's a possibility for that he was continuing to breathe, and that, way, that proves that he just fainted, he didn't really die, and he recuperated for three days in the tomb and then rose again after a long, painful coma. That's taken care of the historicity of this. John didn't even know what he was referring to medically, but he just described what we saw. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Wooden physicians have talked about how that was an indication that he really had died. Now, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies. He's, John's referring to himself here, so that, you may all, all, so that you also may believe. Remember what he says at the end of his gospel, I've written this thing, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and, and that by believing you may have Zoe, life in His name, because He accomplished what He was meaning to accomplish. These things happen so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of His bones will be broken, and as another Scripture says, they will look on the one they've pierced. Now, later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. You see that myrrh, where else have you heard about it? Everybody knows at Christmas time. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh is what the, the soothsayers, the, the Far Eastern gurus who came to pay tribute to Jesus, what they brought. It's a strange gift to give to a baby. It was, it was a, used in a number of contexts, but particularly in embalming. Jesus' to-do list was evidenced even when He was a child, forecast by these wise men bringing myrrh to Him. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, and this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Thus says the Word of God. Holy Spirit, I pray for every person in this room and every person listening online that you would ignite your Word, not to inform our religiosity to our own pride, but to inform our humanity to your glory. Hmm. I want you to go back to verse 30. 
When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, there are two Greek words, usually the, 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 the entire uh, statement is in Greek, but there are two very unique Greek words I want to point out that are so significant for you and me grappling with. Is there a connection with Jesus's to-do list and yours and mine? The first Greek word is translated, that last phrase, he gave up his spirit. Go back to the text just for a moment. He gave up his spirit. Paradokian is the Greek word there. It means literally he handed over. What that is saying is there was something intentional going on. This is not something that happened to Jesus. This is something that he was facilitating. He handed over in John chapter 10. Just a few verses after, he gives that mission statement in verse 17. He says, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Get that. He's wanting to make it very clear. This wasn't a tragic accident and he was a victim. It was part of his to-do list. It was part of his intentionality. He said, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So that's the first thing in verse 30 is there's this intention, there's an intentional plan at work here, but then I want you to, that, that, the phrase, it, it is finished, I'll go back to that slide, it's, the Greek word is tetelestai, and it means literally, it's accomplished. It's accomplished. So, in, in, in John is describing what happened when he says, Jesus, he, he handed over his life. And right before he did that, he said, it is finished. Bottom line, there was something very specific and intentional that he was about. And secondly, it had been accomplished. And in John 17, the night before Jesus was, uh, was forecasting that, in 17 verse 4, he says, I've brought you glory on earth by finishing same Greek root word, accomplishing. Actually, it also is something that would be put on ledgers to say a debt has been canceled, a debt has been paid. The work you gave me to do. So where did all this take place? On a cross. In Latin, the word is crux, for cross. It's where we also get the word crucial. The centrality of the cross, it's not just a religious symbol. It's not just a piece of jewelry. I actually, I've seen several writers, they talk about the, the cross didn't become ornamental until centuries after the last person had seen a crucifixion. It was too horrific to bring up as a point of jewelry. But the reason that the cross is central is because Christianity says it is. And, and Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, we preach Christ crucified. And every day of my life with my to-do list, the reason there can be significance in what I'm doing, whether it's with my taxes or with my quiet times or with my serving, my relational stuff, my generosity, whatever it is, is because of the cross. So let's go to your and my to-do list. I mean, every day, I've got a list, you got a list, but here's the deal. Our, that, 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 all the details of the day, you know, take out the trash, feed the dog, uh, write to the United Nations, you know, it's all sorts of stuff. Underneath that to-do list is another one, a deep one. Issues like worth. Where am I going to get my worth today? 
issues of conscience. What will my conscience lead me to do? How can I recover from the, the failures in my life? The, 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 if, if I've got a guilty conscience about something, what do I do with that? My identity. How am I going to underscore my identity? How am I going to unpack who I am as a human being? Who am I? What is my purpose? So there's a, there's a lot more on that undergirding substantive list, but these are four that are addressed by what Jesus is doing on the cross that impact me on a daily basis. So what I want to do is let's, let's take that to-do list and superimpose this declaration of Jesus where He says, it's finished. So in my search for worth, in my search for a clear conscience, in my search for a substantive identity, in my search for a meaningful purpose, Jesus comes and makes a declaration into my day. His to-do list comes on my to-do list, and I want you to hear how that declaration is unpacked. Re regarding my worth and my yearning for worth, He comes from the cross into my day, and He makes a declaration, and it is, you are loved. You're loved. You're loved. But how do I know? Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do I know if I'm loved? And yes, we yearn for that horizontal love of other human beings, but weird stuff starts happening when I try to extract the love of God from them alone. I mean, I, I, I got to go to Him. How do I know that He loves me? The cross. Brennan Manning, and I, I shared this years ago with one service, but I, and I don't, I'm not sure which service it was, but uh, Brennan Manning, famous author, he's now since gone to be with Jesus. He spoke here at Northland years ago. Uh, beautiful human being, a pastor, priest. When he became a priest, Brennan Manning is not his birth name, when he became a priest, he was told to take on the name of a saint. And he picked the name Brennan. The reason is his childhood friend, his high school buddy that grew up together. Ray Brennan was his name. He and Ray, they, uh, they worked on cars together, went on dates together, played sports together, went to Vietnam together. And on a fateful day, it changed Brennan's life, he and Ray were in a foxhole of sorts in an indentation, taking a break, and he said Ray was eating a, a chocolate bar. They were laughing about growing up in Brooklyn and a couple of things that had happened when they were in high school, and in the midst of the laughter, a grenade thumped and rolled and stopped at a point right between them thrown by the enemy. And in a split second, Ray made a decision. He threw his candy bar, looked at Brennan, and smiled, and then dove on the grenade. Ray Brennan did not survive that, but the man we know to be Brennan Manning did. And he, he came back. I mean, just devastated. He came back, visited Ray's mom, and in Brooklyn, and they were talking about Ray's life, and Brennan said, I, I then had a moment of pitiful reflection that he, I mean, it, I'm embarrassed about now, but I actually looked at Ray's mom and I said, I, do you think Ray really loved me? She looked at him and she said, he said, she got up, she walked in front of him, stood in front of him on the couch pointed her finger at him with tears welling up in her eyes and said, what more could Ray have done for you to show you that he loved you? That's what Paul's writing to the Romans. What more could Jesus do? 
for you to know that today, in all of those, those, uh, those pursuits of trying to prove my worth, to get people to love me, to get people to esteem, to make sure all of that needs to come beneath my embrace of the love of God. In John chapter 13, verse 1, at the beginning of that upper room discourse, remember that's Thursday night, and we went through that upper room discourse, and now we're the next day on Friday. Do you know how John, the friend of Jesus, he starts his record of that. He said it was just before the Passover feast that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of of His love. He now showed them, and literally it means the, the end result of His love, and so He was unpacking that. And so in the midst of my, whatever I got going on today, whatever you got going on today, we're wondering, man, I, I, I just want to, to know my worth. We all have that in here. Now, we can say we don't. We can say we don't care what people think. We don't care. We yearn for that sense of worth from one another. That's okay as long as you don't look for love in all the wrong places. But all of that has to come underneath. Knowing that God loves you. John 3, 16, don't make it trite, don't make it too familiar. For God so valued this, this rubble called human beings and wanted to, to turn them into religious zealots for him that, no, no, no. For God so loved, so loved you that he gave his, his, his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he experience and have that, that eternal zoe, that life that starts right at this moment. All right. Man, that's, that's good. We can just close right now. We're not going to. Uh, wishful thinking on your part, but all these others, these other three, flow out of that one. Are you living, am I living as a loved man? Are you living as a loved man, loved woman? Who couldn't do anything more to, to get God to love him more? Because there is, God will not love you any more now than he will at the end of your life and in all eternity. And so from that comes that second item, that whole notion of my conscience. Uh, into those issues of a guilty conscience, Jesus makes a declaration from the cross into my day, from his list to mine. And he's not only saying you're loved, but he's also saying you're forgiven. He says that on the cross. And understand, it is not a matter of him saying, you know what, I, I just love you so much, we're going to look the other way. No, he's paying a penalty that I owe when he's on that cross. So what, what, what have you done? Look, take a look in the rearview mirror. It could be yesterday or last year or last decade, whatever it is. Uh, what are some of the sins that are in your rearview mirror that you still remember? Could be that a lot of people know about them. Could be nobody knows about them. The fact is we all have an answer for that question. You just thought about them. What do we do with that? Am I trying to, uh, in my to-do list, do things that would assuage my conscience and try to get the, the moral scale back? No, no, no. I am bankrupt spiritually. Here's the deal. Uh, there, let me give you four realities. Reality number one, I'm a sinner. Reality number two, God is just. Reality number three is I can't do anything about reality one and reality two. And therefore, reality four is God is free to do with me, to deal with me as he chooses. And if a lot of people, if you've been in church for all, say, well, oh, okay, well, he has to be gracious to me, though. No, he doesn't. It wouldn't be called grace if he had to. He chooses to. He chooses to because of his love. But in his love, he's absolutely just, so he can't look the other way regarding my sin. It doesn't matter if it's a little sin or a big sin. The slightest sin is an imperfection that then separates me infinitely from God because he cannot, he, he cannot endure any imperfection, any sin. He is holy. 
So the solution of His love and His justice, they meet at the cross because on the cross, out of love, He is fulfilling the debt, the, the, an infinite debt that I owe, an eternal debt. It would take me all eternity to, to pay the penalty, so to speak, of my sin. Ephesians talks about this Ephesians, cha- Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood. This is, a lot of people, it, it, this whole notion of the cross, why couldn't God just say, hey, let's just let bygones be bygones. Let's just pretend you didn't do that. He would violate His character. So a payment had to be made, a payment of a, someone who's fully human but also fully God. You say, why well, fully God and fully human? As to His humanity, He is taking on our sin. As to His divinity, He's doing it in an infinite way, which is why one man's death can apply for you and for you and, and for you and for you and every one of us. It pay an infinite penalty that it would take us otherwise infinity to pay. He says, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. That word forgiveness means to let go of, to release. There's a, there's a verse in Psalm 103. How many of you know how, what the, the, how far is it between the east and the west? I'm not sure how far it is, but as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from, from us. And you say, that sounds too good to be true, and that's why it's called the gospel. And it's not God just having a soft spot towards me. It's because Jesus hung on the cross not to establish a symbol of religiosity, but to pay a debt it would have taken me infinity to pay. And so He makes a declaration into my to-do list on a daily basis, and as He's hanging on that cross, and he's speaking from the cross into my Monday. He says, you're loved. He says, you're forgiven. And third declaration, you're justified. You're justified. That's a word that we don't use a whole lot for. It's a theological word, yes, but it is so rich. I had a mentor long ago, he says, Matt, we'll unpack more of it, but let's start with you understanding that to be justified means that God looks at me just if I'd never sinned, which sounds too good to be true, which is why it's called the gospel. Justification by faith is at the heartbeat, the center of our orthodoxy as followers of Jesus. Now, here's the deal. The the tragedy is, for so many of us, it stays in the realm of orthodoxy and doesn't move into the realm of vibrancy. The fact that I'm justified by my faith in Jesus Christ should enable me to dance, not suffocate under the weight of legalistic Christianity, but instead to dance in obedience to the commands of God in joy. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 Paul says, but now, I want you to understand something, apart from the law, apart from keeping your rules. A lot of times we feel like, okay, my identity is in my religiosity, in my obedience. No, my identity is in Jesus. It's not in what I do. He says, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, religious person, irreligious person, so to speak, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So when I trust Jesus on the cross, when I pray to receive Christ, I'm, I am acknowledging, submitting, I, I'm transferring my trust from my inability to bridge the infinite gap between God and me, and I'm trusting what Jesus did on the cross, and I'm receiving His love, and I'm receiving His forgiveness, and I'm receiving His justification that clothes me. Isaiah 61 talks about us being, us being arrayed in the robes of righteousness. So when God looks at you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know whose righteousness He sees? Jesus is. The same is true for you. 
and me. I, during the uh, pandemic, I watched an older movie that is just powerful. It's called The Cinderella Man. And it's the true story uh, of a guy named Ray Braddock, or James Braddock from, uh, he was born in 1905, was a boxer, culminates with him facing the infamous Max Bear in a boxing arena, Madison Square Bowl, Madison Square Garden Bowl up in Queens on June the 13th, 1934. And Max Bayer had killed a couple of guys, and James Braddock was on a comeback several years older. And everybody thought it was a no-brainer. And in the movie, uh, Braddock's wife comes into the, the, the locker room right before this infamous boxing match, heavyweight title of the world, and he's fearful and having doubts about his identity. And she looks at him and she says, James Braddock, you remember who you are. When I start struggling with my identity, and I mean, I, the Word of God comes to me, the Spirit of God comes to me, Jesus comes to me and says, remember who you are. You were justified by your faith in me. You have been made righteous. Now, we've got a responsibility to pursue acts of righteousness, but we're doing it in response to the righteousness we've already been given. And so the combination of receiving His love and receiving His forgiveness and receiving His justification results in a fourth declaration that He makes from the cross into my Mondays in which I am struggling and grappling for purpose and significance, and He says, you are alive. You who were dead in your transgressions and sins, muted in your humanity, yes, able to laugh and cry and create and do all sorts of amazing things, it's been cloaked under this, this pall of death. Be free. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign? in life through that one man. So many people think that the gospel is about life after death, is it? Yes, but the gospel is also about life instead of death. Choosing life on a daily basis, the zoe of God, and that infiltrates the way that I do my vocation and do my recreation and do my relationships and I do my grieving and my doctor's appointments. Uh, in the 17th century, John Owen, wrote a theological, a brilliant treatise. The title of it, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. Death died that day. Death was stripped of its power. Not just physical death, but the death that robs you and me of, of purposeful days. I'm going to ask our worship team to come out. We're going to make a proclamation. You guys remember the comparison between life and death. We've looked at it several times. I want to show you this chart. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. What does spiritual death look like? Aimlessness, guilt, shame, restlessness, confusion, despair, emptiness, superficiality, aloneness. This is stuff I'm battling every day in my to-do list. Jesus took all of that on Himself on the cross, and He canceled the written code, Paul writes. And when someone comes and acknowledges Jesus hanging on the cross for me, for you, and receiving Him as Savior. It's not a matter of changing my designation on a census, moving to the de designation of Christian. It's a matter of me coming alive and moving. That's a daily, daily decision. Because whenever I sin, even as a follower of Christ, and I can experience some of those death characteristics. But I now have the option 
to see death arrested in my Mondays, and instead of aimlessness experiencing purpose, instead of guilt, I experience forgiveness, instead of shame, I experience his acceptance, instead of restlessness, I experience his shalom, instead of confusion, his illumination into my day, instead of despair, there's hope for the future, instead of emptiness, there's completeness, instead of living superficially with painkillers, I live with a sense of significance, and instead of being alone in the universe, I live as somebody who is loved by the living God who demonstrated his love through his son hanging on a cross. And so let's stand together and let's celebrate that fact. It's the gospel. You guys ready to sing the gospel? Jesus, thank you so much for the way that you have worked in our lives and the way that you've interrupted history by loving on us, forgiving us, justifying us, and breathing life into us. So hear us, not as religious folks singing a song, but as men and women who were dead and who've now been made alive singing the gospel. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way, let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given. My morning grew quiet, my fear rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me.
That is the good news of the gospel. I am so glad you've been here. We're all privileged to be able to be on this journey together. Thank you for joining us if you're online. And if you are not yet someone who's tasted that love, that forgiveness, that being made right with God, that righteousness, that life, I want to encourage you. Put that to the top of your to-do list to say, I got to grapple with the gospel. If you're here out in the, the foyer, there's these flyers you've seen before, Becoming Fully Alive. This will walk you through. What's it, what's it like to pray to receive Christ as Lord and Savior online? You can get that by northlandchurch.net slash fully alive. Maybe you need somebody to, to pray with you. or uh, Go to northlandchurch.net slash links, L-I-N-K-S. And you can let people know how to pray for you. You can find out more about who we are. We have some digger deep, digging deeper questions for you related specifically to this teaching this morning. So uh, avail yourself of that. And those of you here on campus, we're going to ask, as we normally do, just for social distancing, for you to remain in your place till you're escorted out by an usher. We'll be starting at the back and then moving forward. So you can sit down if you want or stand up either way. But uh, let's continue journeying through, get a cup of coffee out there at Artisan's Kitchen, and then would you receive the Word of God as you move into your week? You're headed back into the valley of the shadow of death, but I want you to go. In the name of Jesus, go as men and women who are loved, who are forgiven, who are justified, and who are alive, and go give His life away. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.